and uh, good afternoon everybody. Thank you again for coming to our annual general meeting. You will notice that we have a much smaller room today it's because in uh, typical Pato style we're reducing costs and we're using the room with, that comes with our tenancy in this building and we get it for free. So unfortunately that only means we have space for our investors and our directors and our senior management and some bankers out there I see. All the rest of the Pedo staff that sometimes come to our annual general meeting while they're upstairs and they're working hard uh, trying to make uh, more money for you. So uh, we like it that way. Uh, the board and the management team that are here today will uh, be around after my presentation and they can answer some additional questions if you have any. Um, feel free to stick around, have a coffee, mingle with the staff and that are here and, uh, and ask them all the hard questions. So to start off with just a plain language advisory. I'm going to tell you about my vision of Pato's future today. I'm going to also tell you where I think commodity prices are going to go. Of course, these are called forward-looking statements. I'm going to be truthful and use everything I know about Pato and the industry to predict the future, but I'll likely be wrong on both accounts. Almost certainly the commodity price, uh, oil and gas exploration and production is a risky business, so I encourage you to please do your homework and, uh, of course, don't blame me if it doesn't work out. So before I uh, get into today's presentation and the discussion of what's happening in the in industry and what's happening with, uh, with us at Pato, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Pato's senior management team. We have a very small and efficient team at Pato. Um, I often brag about you know, how we have the best gas to ass ratio in the industry. Um, these are the key leaders of that team. Uh, we don't often bring them along or I don't often bring them along on the road to talk to investors and I did want to take a moment to acknowledge them here today. So if you guys could stand when I say your name. Starting with our uh, illustrious uh, Chief Operating Officer for the last decade, Scott Robinson, who is uh, trying desperately to retire. Scott, we've, uh, we've been keeping him around for a few years here as a free agent, and uh, this year we decided to get him to work on some new ventures for us, so we made him the Vice President of New Ventures. And there's been so many new ventures that Scott's been working double time, but uh, for the deal we made was he was only going to get part-time salary, so a really good deal for us. Uh, next up, we've got uh, J.P. Lachance. J.P. took over Scott's role as Chief Operating Officer this year earlier. Uh, J.P. is also the VP of Engineering, so doing double duty. He's uh, been with Pato since 2001, or sorry, 2011. Uh, he and Scott worked together way back when in Chevron, so must be cut of the same cloth, which is probably a good thing for us. Uh, next is Kathy Turgeon, our Chief Financial Officer and uh, well, Vice President of Finance. Uh, Kathy's been with Pato since 2004. She started as controller and moved her way up and now sits at the front table. So as of a few minutes ago, she was voted to join Pato's board, so congratulations, Kathy. Uh, we also have our Vice President of Land, Tim Louie, in the room. Tim, where are you at? There's Tim. We have our Vice President of Exploration, Dave Thomas. I saw him earlier stand up. Uh, Vice President of Drilling and Completions, Lee Curran, is here. So if you want to ask Lee all about the drilling later, feel free. And our Vice President of Production, uh, Todd Burdick, is here somewhere too. So that's your management team. Those are the guys that are uh, running Pato and doing their best job every day to deploy your capital in the lowest risk and most profitable way possible. So this past year, we finished up our 19th year of operations. We're now embarking on our 20th year, which is quite something. I've been uh, at Pato since early 2001, so 17 of those 19 years, and uh, it's been quite the roller coaster ride for me and for everybody that's been at Pato that long. Uh, we've seen periods of significant investment and rapid growth, and we've seen periods where we needed to be very disciplined and to preserve the value that we've created for shareholders. Uh, we've been through periods of incredibly strong natural gas prices, I think $12 at one point, and through periods of very weak prices. Sadly, today is one of those times. Gas price today is even lower than when we started Pato in 1998. And we've seen times when the investment community was very interested in natural gas companies and what companies like Pato were doing, and other times where all anybody's looking at is the gas price. And I think our share price is a great example of that. It correlates either to our production growth at times or just to the natural gas price, which it tends to be correlated to right now. But I think through it all, we've persevered and we've stuck to our strategy. And I think it was a very good strategy right from day one. Persevered to become one of the largest gas producers in Canada, in fact. We're the fifth largest gas producer now. And one of the few to have done it with the drill bit. 
We're not a collection of other people's assets. Almost everything we have today, we went out and built ourselves. And the quality of that asset base, I believe, is second to none, which I think is something to celebrate here. So with our 20th birthday just around the corner on October 23rd, 19, uh, 2018, as uh, shareholders, as employees, and as company who's uh, very proud of what it's accomplished, I think it's only fitting that we take time to celebrate that 20th birthday on that occasion. But despite being the fifth largest gas producer in Canada, it's not about size. It has never been about size at PEDO. PEDO and its strategy has always been about profit, and about investing a dollar of shareholders' capital, of your capital, and turning it into more. And because that's been our focus for the last 19 years, we've been one of the most profitable energy companies in Canada. In 2017, we again posted significant earnings, $177 million dollars, on a capital program of $521 million, that's 34 cents of profit for every dollar of capital invested. And we continue with our 19-year track record of solid earnings performance. Every year we invest capital to generate a profit, and that is the whole point of PEDO. And it's out of those profits that dividends were paid to our shareholders. Over the last 19 years we invested $5.7 billion of your capital, we generated $2.3 billion of profit, and we paid out $2.3 billion in distributions and dividends, which is not bad for a team of just 50 employees. How we do it is a question I'm often asked when I'm on the road talking to investors, and the answer is pretty simple. We focus on the bottom line. We control what capital we spend to build new producing reserves. We control the cost of those reserves to produce and, and sell them. And it's relative to the price that we sell them for, which, of course, we can't control we ensure our costs are low enough to always generate a profit. Last year was no different uh, than any other year. We spent $1.36 per MCFE to build new producing reserves. That's full cycle, all costs included, land, seismic, everything. We spent $0.83 cents to produce those reserves out of the ground and sell them. Again, all costs, G&A and interest included, and we sold them for $3.83, leaving us, or $3.38, leaving us with $1.19 of profit, which is around a 35% margin. And that's very similar, really, to the result of our entire history. Every year we build it and produce it for less than what we sell it. I've been saying that for 10 years now. And on average, the profit over the 19 years has been 36%. So 2017, really, with its 35% profit margin, is very similar to the average. And that was really in a year where we had relatively low natural gas prices. But I suppose that's the point. At Pater, we control the costs so that in any year we can generate a profit. And we expect going forward into the future that that strategy is going to be no different and that hopefully our profit margins are exactly the same. So in summary, over the last 19 years, we've invested $5.7 billion of capital purchasing goods and services in Alberta. Over that time, we purchased 585 se or 85 sections of land from the provincial government. We've drilled almost 1,500 wells, which is a lot of activity, Lee will tell you. We discovered an amazing 5.8 trillion cubic feet equivalent of reserves. We've produced one and a half of those reserves. And along the way, we paid over $800 million in royalties to the Alberta Crown and generated $2.3 billion in profits for our shareholders. And while that's what we disclose in our financial statements, there are some in our society that still don't understand the importance of what we do. Some think we shouldn't exist. That we should just leave these natural gas reserves in the ground. And I probably don't need to remind everybody in the room why this is so important and why what PEDO does is so important. We all understand it, but I thought I'd put it out there anyway because not enough people these days are saying it. Our gas heats your homes. And this past winter was an obvious reminder of why that's so important. Just spend a few hours outside at minus 20, and you are reminded that the heat we provide is not only necessary, it is life-saving. Beto's production last year was sufficient to heat all the homes in Alberta and Saskatchewan combined. And since our gas is extracted at half the environmental impact of the rest of the Canadian natural gas industry, and burning gas has half the environmental impact of coal or any alternative fuel you would choose to use, we can all be very thankful that PEDO is here to provide us with that energy. But if you're not a homeowner, then think of it this way.
Pluto's natural gas in 2017 provided the energy required to run all the public and private hospitals in Canada. Hospitals are incredibly energy intensive. They're large, they're open 24 hours a day, and they have to be temperature controlled, and they have lots of electrical requirements to run all the various equipment used in providing the healthcare services to everyone in our society. Pedro provided that energy. But maybe you never get sick, and you or your family doesn't live in a house or an apartment, but you still have to eat. And for the last six months, and for at least six months of the year in Canada, you can't grow your own food. So Peter provides the energy required to power your grocery stores. In fact, in 2017, we provided enough energy in the gas we produce to power all of the Walmart stores across North America. And grocery stores are an even larger consumer of energy than hospitals are. So it's important that they have access to the most efficient energy supply from the most efficient supplier, and that's Pedo. You know, I could go on and on why the society needs the Pedos of the world. And probably one of the final reasons is that our industry tends to fund critical life-saving emergency services that keep each and every one of us safe every day. With every well we drill, we fund and support emergency services. We rarely use them because we make safety a top priority on all of our job sites and for all our operations. But we pay for them nonetheless. And as a result, the general public has access to them too. We wouldn't have without the support of this industry. You just look at the financial sponsors printed on the side of a Stars Air Ambulance. It's all energy companies. It's not environmental groups. It's energy companies. So for this foreseeable future, we need companies just like Pato to lead the world in low-cost, profitable, efficient, and responsible resource development and production. And as I mentioned, Pedro's gas has half the CO2 emissions intensity of the rest of the Canadian gas industry. And gas is the cleanest burning of all the hydrocarbon fuels that we can choose from that are burned around the world today. So that makes it even more important that we keep doing what we're doing at Pedro. My little political rant for you. Now, you know, I suspect everyone in this room already knows the importance of the energy industry in Canada and the good that Pato does. And you're probably more interested in hearing about what's going on with gas prices and our stock and what management's going to do about it all. So let's start with gas prices. As you've probably seen or heard, the U.S. has recently become self-sufficient with meeting its natural gas needs, growing production over the last decade to about 75 BCF a day of dry gas to match their 75 Bs or so of domestic demand. And of course, for the last 30 years, that wasn't the case. That's just why Canada was able to develop and sell so much extra production relative to its own domestic demand, because we just sold it into the U.S. market. Or probably more accurately, they came to Alberta to get it. Now that hole in the U.S. market is effectively gone. Perhaps it's gone for good, or perhaps it will return. But for now, they're supplying their own demands. Either way, we no longer have that captive market for the four or five BCF a day of extra supply that we have in Canada. And that's obviously had a significant impact on the relative price of natural gas in Western Canada as compared to the U.S. For the entire time that we had that captive market in the U.S., our Canadian gas prices traded alongside the U.S. After you adjust for currency and transport, it was almost the same number. And now the forward strip for Canadian gas trades at a significant discount less than $2 Canadian, or $1.70 per MMBTU US, as compared to about $2.70 or $2.80 US. They're getting down there. And that's, that, that delta is forecast for the foreseeable future. But hasn't the US added a bunch of export, you ask? And yes, that's true. In fact, they are growing their LNG exports, and they expect to be exporting close to 9 BCF a day by 2019, which is just around the corner. Unfortunately, the majority of their export capacity is in the Gulf of Mexico, down where Brian lives in Texas, and that's a long ways away from the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin, which would be fine if we could access the export pipelines to get to the Gulf at the current regulated tolls. We'd still be able to make a little bit of money, but the problem is those pipes are all full. So we either need to wait for them to empty, or we need to build new pipelines to get to market. And if we're going to build new pipelines, then maybe we should build our, to our own west coast and uh, ship our gas off of Canadian coasts rather than paying the Americans to ship it out of North America for us. This lack of access to egress out of Alberta. 
And to further exacerbate the problem, one of the largest Canadian producers and their partners added about three quarters of the BCF a day. You can see that jump up in production in that little graph last fall, and that was more than the Nova system could really handle. The Nova system's good for about 12 bees a day, so now we have all this gas backing up effectively into Alberta, and we can't even get it out to the border of Alberta and Saskatchewan or Alberta and BC. So all of this, of course, caused the future strip of ACO to collapse. We all saw that at the start of 2017. The strip was porting to a long-term price of around 250 a gigajoule. That was just fine for Pedo. That's the purple line there. By the end of last year, the strip had collapsed uh, to below $1.50 as a start, and it took four years to get back to $2. That's our green line, and that's basically where we still sit today with the pink line. And while that future strip presents a lot of difficulty for Canadian gas producers, there is more pipe coming uh, for Alberta that should help, uh, hopefully alleviate some of the bottleneck. NOVA is planning a $7.2 billion capital program supposed to add 2.2 BCF a day, 1.6 of it, exiting Alberta to the south into uh, U.S. markets, and then 0.6 BCF a day of capacity that should dump some more gas into the oil sands area for consumption. And that's why you see that future strip strengthen as we get closer to the addition of this capacity to the system out into 2021-2022. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel for us. And ultimately the prize is pretty big. If we can connect North America to the rest of the world and start to enjoy some of the prices that they are paying for natural gas, there's a big win for Canada. And it's not just a financial win. For every gigajoule of gas that we can supply to China or Asia, that's a gigajoule of coal that they don't need to burn and a positive environmental outcome. So we need to get busy getting our gas on the world stage so we can get $10.45 for it in Japan. That would work. Let me leave off this topic of gas prices with one other positive note, leave you a little optimistic uh, today. North American demand for gas has never been greater. We have one of the largest regional markets for gas in the world, supported by the smallest amount of reserves. So the market here is uh, about 100 BCF for North America, both production and consumption. And yet when you look at the reserve to production ratio for proved reserves in North America, it's just a little over 10 years. That's the shortest of anywhere else in the world, and a far cry from the 120 years of reserve life they have in the Middle East. So really, when you think about it, any abundance of supply we have today that is swinging the market in one direction, we're a supply-driven market today, could easily flip to a demand-driven market tomorrow, with that short of a reserve life. So the gas prices we have today are by no means what they're going to be forever, when we have this tiny little bit of reserves that we're working with. So with that framework of ACO prices and the challenges that that creates in mind, what are we going to do? And so I thought today to answer that question and provide some more color about what we're going to do operationally this year, I want to call up our new Chief Operating Officer, J.P. LaCharles, to talk to you about that. J.P. Thanks, Darren. Um, well, folks, uh, we're going to do what we always do, and that's um, focus on investing shareholders' uh, capital in projects that make money. Um, unfortunately, that means that uh, some of our opportunities uh, we'll have, that we've got in our inventory will have to wait until we can either get stronger gas pricing or lower costs. But uh, we do have some opportunities that still make a robust return, even at these uh, low gas prices right now. And I'm talking specifically about the cardium play in the greater Sundance area. Now recall that the uh, cardium is the shallowest uh, zone we develop in the deep basin. It's also the, uh, the one with the most natural gas liquids, uh, which is why the economics remain so robust. Some of our more seasoned shareholders would remember the cardium is, is where Pedro began back in 1998. Certainly, Don, you'd appreciate that. And our inventory in the cardium is, uh, is very deep, with over five, uh, 500 locations across our entire land base. And as we continue to have success with this new completion design, I'm confident we're going to add uh, some more additional cardium inventory going forward. So for 2018, we're going to be focused on the cardium in the uh, greater Sundance area, uh, drilling about 40 to 50 wells. Uh, this is a uh, place here where we have uh, 548 net sections of cardium rights uh, with over 370 locations identified internally. Um, 
tachycardium in Sundance is extremely well defined, uh, meaning it's got a very low geologic risk. Um, we already have over 380 vertical and horizontal producers, and coupled with that, we have another 1,300 well bores uh, that penetrate you know, the cardium, giving us lots of rock samples, gas logs across the zone, and that helps us with the geologic mapping and the steering of the well when we drill our horizontals. We, may, uh, we also have uh, the area completely covered with 3D seismic, which, uh, which helps with the identification of faults to either target or avoid, as the case may be. And although we may have uh, we may have to acquire a few uh, new leases, for the most part we have uh, all the infrastructure uh, in place already, including all the roads, well sites, pipelines, and gas plants. So our new completion design has yielded average results that are twice that of what they were in the past, and for less capital. With the old design, uh, we would we would spend about 4.2 million to drill, complete, equip, and tie in, including a provision for. Um, facilities, land, and seismic, as we always do. For that, we were getting about 2.75 BCFE, uh, which included around 47 barrels a million of, of natural gas liquids. And now with the new design, wells are coming in around 3.7 million, and we're getting 3.75 BCFE, which, uh, which also includes that same 47 barrels a million of, of NGLs. So the internal rates of return have increased from 10% in the past to over 40% now on this current strip pricing. And that 40% is with a full cycle capital allocation, which, uh, which is smaller now since, you know, since as we've already I've mentioned before, that uh, that infrastructure you know, predominantly is in place already. I've even stressed this, uh, stress tested this new type curve down to a dollar a gigajoule flat gas price, and it still yields us a 30% internal rate, or sorry, a 23% internal rate of return. So quite robust. So obviously, we're excited about the cardium and what it can do for us this year. Uh, with a steady diet of that cardium drilling going forward, uh, backfilling the decline of the leaner Spirit River, we'll see our average corporate liquid yields climb from about 9 to 10% currently, up to 15% by the end of next year. And that extra 5,000 barrels a day or so of liquid has a material impact on our revenue and cash flow, almost $100 million uh, annually. But besides the cardium, we do have some other initiatives we're working on. Uh, both uh, new resource opportunities and new infrastructure opportunities. And to talk about, uh, a little bit more about those new ventures, I'm going to pass the podium on to Scott Robinson, our Executive VP of New Ventures, to come up and talk about them. Okay, thank you everyone for coming today. Thanks, JP. Um, let me just move it forward here. One of the, the key discerning attributes of our company uh, from the beginning and, and particularly today is the strength of our facility ownership and, and the uh, concentration of that facility ownership. As you can see in this slide here, um, the, the, we've got nine uh, essentially wholly owned gas plants. One of them has a small working interest but uh, primarily uh, essentially 100 percent and that affords us with extremely strong position uh, in dealing with uh, bringing on new wells or adjusting our production as the case may be depending on prices and um, it's an incredible midstream asset which as you can see totals just under a BCF a day of processing capacity um, we've got the nine plants on right now and we've got a tenth uh, in vision for the coming end of this year or early next year this next slide oh. My voice is changing. The, the next, uh, next slide shows the greater Sundance area. Um, it's our largest producing area, as many of you are aware, uh, where six of our nine gas plants are located. And they're located in a very prime geographical uh, area of the province, which affords us some unique verti vertically integrated opportunities with our resource base. Uh, the area provides ready, project ready egress for such things as power generation, uh, LPG transport to the west coast, and petrochemical production and transport to the west coast. The highway system, we're right, right along Highway 16. Uh, the rail line system, CNR has a, a, a major rail artery which passes through the area. 
and the uh, extensive high voltage power lines in the area provide the basis for uh, these opportunities. And we're, we are in various levels of discussion with different project proponents uh, across the spectrum of power generation, uh, methanol manufacture, and propane supply and export, uh, with us being a, a key s potential natural gas or gas liquid supplier to some of those projects. And just further expanding on this uh, greater Sundance area, uh, we're also evaluating uh, the expansion of our current gas plant processing to strip more natural gas liquids out of our sales gas stream, which passes through these plants. Currently, in aggregate, we're only extracting about 50% of the butane and a little under 20% of the propane that comes uh, to these plants in the form of uh, feedstock from the wells. With the prospect of fairly moderate to low natural gas prices on the horizon and with stronger liquid prices, uh, we are incented to try to get more out of our gas than we have in the past. And if you look at propane, for instance, there are some pretty key things that are happening that will, uh, that will prop up uh, some of the prices associated with these liquid hydrocarbons. We were aware of uh, a couple of polypropylene plants uh, that are on the horizon here that have been supported by some government incentives. In addition, Alta Gas is just finishing up their Ridley Island export, a propane export terminal on the coast that's good for about 40,000 barrels a day and, and could be expanded up to double that. And behind Alta Gas's project, there are a number of other export projects. So in aggregate, with the polypropylene plants and with the export of uh, propane on the coast, we're looking at potentially 100 to 150 barrels a day of, of fairly near-term draw on the propane needs in addition to the current markets. And, and the current production in Western Canada is only about 250,000 barrels a day. So the prospect looks really good for propane prices. Um, so we are currently looking at, uh, and we're in the design phase and the costing stage for a bunch of new low-cost deep cuts, or what we call cheap cut process additions to our gas plants to allow us to achieve higher recovery levels, as much as 90% of the incoming propane. Uh, furthermore, uh, in 2017, we, ins we installed uh, a couple key liquids gathering lines in this area. One that gathers, gathers up all of our LPG from our plants and takes it up to the, from the Swanson plant to the south, all the way up to the no Old Man plant to the north. And another line that we installed takes our condensate from the Old Man plant to the north and get, picks up the Nose Hill plant condensate and carries it all down to Swanson where we put it into, uh, put the condensate into a, pem uh, a permanent pipeline system. Uh, the LPG that's gathered up to the Old Man plant is put into a Plains uh, pipeline that takes it to Fort Saskatchewan for fractionation and distribution and that's where we get paid for that product. We are currently contemplating reversing our LPG line to carry that product down to our Swanson plant uh, where we could conceivably install a fractionation facility, purify that LPG into the propane, butane and pentane's constituents and then deal with it locally there either exporting it uh, on a rail line to the west coast or uh, uh, tracking it or, or railing it into markets within Alberta. So that's another value added consideration. The deep cutting of our plants to give us more propane, butane and condensate and then the purification of these products. So we're looking at that right now. We're quite excited about that in combination with the other things that I mentioned. Power generation, methanol production and uh, a few other ideas that we have in the works. And we expect to be able to talk more concretely on these items in the, in the coming balances uh, about the remaining quarters of this year. So I'll turn it back over to Darren to finish up here. Okay, well, thanks, Scott. That's a lot of new ventures, hey? So I don't think Scott's allowed to go fishing full-time just yet. Way too many ventures for you to work on. Those are the, those are the the, the list, oh, okay, we've also got the Bitcoin in the pot that we're going to, okay. Uh, so just to summarize the uh, capital program for this year, um, we've got uh, 50 to 60 wells in the uh, drill schedule this year. Uh, as JP alluded to, the majority of those are going to be cardium wells. 
And uh, the more excitement we see from the cardium going forward here, the more it's going to want to be front and center on the on the drilling schedule. Uh, as he mentioned, and as Scott talked about, you know, we have very little facility investments this year. Uh, we don't have to. We've got a lot of processing capacity for all of the wells that we're drilling. Uh, we own all the pipe and we have lots of capacity to handle all this drilling this year. So really we don't have a lot of infrastructure to put in other than the stuff that Scott's talked about over and above, which will be uh, in design phase for most of this year. And as usual, we'll keep evaluating a lot of the uh, other opportunities that we see, other uh, organic opportunities to get into new areas and new lands, to add uh, more cardium rights, to to look at some other plays and uh, maybe even look at some of the corporate and M&A activity that might be available out there. But on the surface, this capital program is about half of our available funds for operations for the year. So we'll be paying down a substantial amount of debt this year. Sorry, Eva. So here's what that looks like. Uh, as you can see, we expect our production is going to be a little bit seasonal. A little bit cyclical with the gas price. Uh, we're seeing some already weak summer prices and so we have let our production decline a bit going into the summer and that makes perfect sense rather than shut it in. No point in bringing on a bunch of new wells right now because the prices are pretty weak. Instead we'll get really busy after breakup here. Lee's going to be busy after breakup drilling through the summer and we'll bring a lot of this volume on at the end of the year when the uh, gas price gets quite a bit stronger. And then for 2019, we're going to have to make a call in, based on where gas prices are going and what we're seeing. Um, we have the option, obviously, of accelerating with the inventory that we've got. If we do have a larger capital program next year, then we will be growing our production. Uh, but if we decide that uh, the gas prices aren't smartening up fast enough and uh, we want to take a little more time on the cardium, then uh, we could have another capital program like the one this year that would hold us just about flat. We probably still would have a a weak summer production just to uh, line up with the gas price weakness. I think that only makes sense. But as always, our focus is going to be on controlling costs, as it always is. Uh, we're targeting cash costs this year in the order of 80 to 90 cents. Q Q1 was a little bit high, but that's coming out of a very cold winter. We used a lot of methanol this past winter and had to clear away a lot of snow. And uh, we expect summer costs are going to be a lot lower and get down hopefully closer to that 80 cent level. We'll keep grinding away as Pato always does get the costs out of this out of the system and we also expect our F and D's are going to come down quite a bit as uh, JP was showing you the cardium alone looks like it has about a dollar in MCF of uh, F and D costs so if we can get those down closer to a buck then we will preserve our 35 percent profit that we have at the bottom line there and when we look into 2019 uh, we see gas prices and our hedges are rolling off but uh, with the increase in liquids that we have and some more grinding on costs, I think we can uh, we can get close to that 35% as well. So uh, looking out, I think uh, we're trying to preserve that level of profit margin. I think we'll be successful in doing that. It's not a big reach. Looking at our hedge protection, you can see that our hedges uh, fall off a little bit as they go out into the future. That's natural. That's the way we've designed it, that tiered sort of schedule. Uh, we'll be adding more hedges as we go forward and building up that. But we've also started to diversify our markets away from ACO. Uh, this one market that seems to be controlled by the one pipeline company a lot more than we would like. Uh, we'll try and get diversified away from that. Uh, we've already got some summer uh, NYMEX basis deals, about 70,000 a day uh, that protect the summer, link us to the Henry Hub pricing. Uh, we can start to hedge that as we go forward. And then beyond 2020, we've uh, started to contract some transportation out of Alberta and that should get us out to those U.S. markets as well. Uh, ultimately, we're targeting to have about 40% of our gas uh, linked to ACO, 40% linked to those U.S. markets, and then about 20% hopefully to some inter-Alberta industrial direct connections like Scott was talking about, power generation companies or uh, methanol producers or the like. So a nice diverse uh, portfolio. So that's basically the latest on Pato, where we're up to and uh, where we sit today, uh, how we're positioned to survive in the short term and very much thrive in the long term. We're quite excited about this, uh, about being a one-trick pony like we always were in the Cardium. Uh, some of the potential that we're seeing out of the play that we have there with this new completion design is really exciting. I think we're just starting to tickle it and uh, we expect that we're going to get uh, better and better results from it as we move forward. So the economics look uh, particularly uh, attractive right now. So I'm going to stop there and uh, answer any questions anybody has.